Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In today's episode, we talk about Chris Sale throwing some punches, Cubs in the clutch, Hawks gone wild, Derek Rose's new case of narcolepsy, and what the hell was Scottie Pippen's daughter doing? All in this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. But before we start, I want to mention our sponsors. Up first is the Rockford Ice Hogs. Rockford hit the ground running in their quest for the Calder Cup, winning games 1 and 2 on the road in Texas to take a 2 0 series lead over the Stars in the Western Conference quarterfinals. The Ice Hogs picked up their first playoff win since 2008 with a come from behind 4 2 triumph in Friday's game 1 before rolling to a 4 1 win following night. With the series shifting to the Forest City, Rockford has uh, up to three chances at home to pick up one more victory and put an end to Texas reign as the Calder Cup champions. Next game is Wednesday, April 29th. That's tomorrow, folks. Game three at Rockford. Game starts at 7 p.m. The Ice Hogs will play their first Calder Cup playoff game in the Forest City since 2010 when the opening round series shifts to Rockford for game three. The first 1,500 fans will receive a free cowbell courtesy of BMO Harris Bank. The festivities begin prior to puck drop during a pregame block party sponsored by Swedish American Hospital. Fans can also sign up to win an assortment of great prizes during the Ice Hogs Win on Wednesday promotion. The show is also brought to you by Audible.com. Head on over to audibletrial.com slash Swirsky Sports and get one of these free audiobooks. Absolutely free. Blood on the Horns, The Long Strange Ride of Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls. This book details the infighting and conflict between Jordan, Phil Jackson, Scottie Pippen, whose daughter, what the hell was she doing, and the team's general manager, Jerry Krause, and owner, Jerry Reinsdorf. Or, Turning the, uh, the Black Sox White, The Misunderstood Legacy of Charles A. Kaminsky. Tim Hornbreaker not only tells the full story of Kaminsky's incredible life in the sport at the time, but also debunks the Black Sox controversy. Check out any one of these or 100,000 other titles for absolutely free. All you have to do is go to audibletrial.com slash Swirsky Sports and you will get one of these audiobooks for no money. Free. Frizzle. Alright, with that out of the way, let's talk about our winning team, the Chicago Blackhawks. I won that series against the, uh, the Nashville Predators four games to two. And honestly, it got off to a rocky start. I mean, since the last time we talked, starting that, that first period of the first game, 3 nothing after the first period, I really was getting worried. These were two teams that were really struggling going into the series. The Hawks were struggling at the end. The Predators were struggling at the end. Somebody had to click. And based on the games, I, I mean, the games were very well played for the most part. I... I I don't know if it was two teams, though, that were playing down to each other's level or if both teams were rising up and, and playing good hockey. I guess we're going to find out when uh, Series 2 starts against the Minnesota Wild. But just some more about that Predators series. It's, it was a weird series. It was a lot of peaks and valleys for the Blackhawks, and it was kind of like a microcosm of their whole season, all in this one series, this one six-game series. You had. Uh, Corey Crawford just not playing well. Scott Darlin coming in and becoming, well, the Chicago's darling. People were calling for Crawford's head. I, I mean, I really want to read through some of these awful, mean tweets that I was reading about Corey Crawford and how much people hate him. And I, I don't understand it because Crawford is a good goalie. I mean, look at his stats. It's just that he's the guy that we that we uh we have here and he's our quote unquote guy 
that's that's a little hard for sometimes for fans to swallow is if your guy isn't perfect all the time, especially in Chicago. It's we are we're really up and down with with our with our athletes. But with they uh the team defense in front of I mean Crawford, don't get me wrong, was not playing well in that in that first game. He just wasn't playing well. And I backed fully Coach Q. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't back Coach Q all the time, but I fully backed him when he went Crawford game two. Because Crawford is your guy. Crawford's the guy the, all year. He's won a Stanley Cup. And as much as I like Scott Darling, and we've had him on the show, and he's a really, really nice guy. He was just absolutely wonderful to talk to. Loved having him on the show. Want to have him on again. But he's. He hasn't proved anything in this league yet. And this is a league that you ride the hot goalie. Crawford's been a really good goalie for for his time in Chicago. It was time for him to step up, earn that paycheck, and ride them ride him to another Stanley Cup finals. But so you if you're Coach Q, you've gotta go to Crawford game two. And it didn't work out, unfortunately. So you go to Darling for game three, and he plays lights out hockey. He talks win. Uh, but, but the game wasn't all about Scott Darling and Corey Crawford and one playing bad and the other playing well and flipping roles and the other one playing bad and playing good. It, it's a lot to do with the defense that's in front of him. You've got... It, if you have your druthers... And you're a good hockey team planning to go deep into the the NHL playoffs, which is just absolutely grueling. You need to roll six defensemen deep. You you have to. You playing four defensemen is it, just basically playoff suicide. You you can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. You're not going to go far doing that. And Coach Q, this is where the two of us really disagree. And I get. The difference in our pedigrees of who's a Hall of Famer and who's some guy sitting in his basement talking to you via the internet. I get it. I really do. But it doesn't mean I'm not right and he's not wrong. I, you can't. What they're doing is starting with six defensemen, but two of them are, are Michael Roosevelt, who has been, except for one game in that series, and for most of the season, he's just been really bad. I mean, he's regressed really quickly in his play. And then you've got Timo Kiemann, who's just not playing well. He's He looks his age. He still is not conditioned to be able to play well. He's not playing well in, in general. And when it comes down to the nitty-gritty, it's they're short-shifting those two guys, and they're long-shifting Seabrook, Keith, Jalmerson, and Oduya. Uh... You've got Keith, who's not he's not playing up to the level he's played the last few years. And if you note, if you notice, is the, the two years the Hawks won the cup, Duncan Keith was playing at top defenseman level. I mean, he was he was playing some of the best hockey as far as defensemen in all of the NHL. He's not playing that this year. I don't know if it's the minutes, I don't know if age is catching up to him. I don't know if he's just if moving those pairings around is is not working, but whatever it is, is Keith's not playing well. Uh, Odui has been spotty. Even Jalmerson had not as been his usual rock solid self. And I love uh, Jalmerson, but when you start adding these minutes up, it gets old really quickly. And the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs are basically in another. After a very, very long, grueling season, it's another long, grueling extension to the season. You, so you, if you're planning to play four defensemen, they're going to get tired. And you're going to have what you had in this series is giving up a lot of goals to a team that was struggling to score goals. I, I'm, I'm scared to see what happens if they, they play a team that can really put some points up. And... uh. Pecorine is is a fantastic goalie. I, I hope uh, fans of Nashville Predators don't don't get on him too much. But he had a rough series, and 
as uh, Eddie O said several times, he was a leaky goalie. He made some great stops, but he gave up some gr- juicy rebounds and 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 let some uh, played some questionable pucks off the boards and and missed some some plays there. But I, I just I don't see that happening in the second round. Uh, you, you're playing Minnesota, who's who's playing as good as anybody right now. They went through it and decimated. Uh, uh, my God, I'm drawing them. I'm having such an old man moment today. Uh, you have Minnesota just taking it to St. Louis, and and St. Louis was a good good team. They were they were one of the best record teams in in all of hockey, and you have Minnesota that went in there and took care of business, uh, and uh, and and just decimated them. Um, so you end up with you're the Blackhawks and you beat probably the only team slumping worse than you in the first round and you made it a series. I mean, granted, granted you won in six games and that's fairly dominant, uh, but you you gave up a lot of goals. You had a lot of gave up a lot of goals. You played some poor defense. Uh, power play wasn't very good and penalty kill wasn't very good. And they had a leaky goalie that you were had difficulty scoring on at times. That's a little scary. Uh, I really like the the Blackhawks matchups with a lot of teams that are in the that are still alive in the playoffs. I like them against Anaheim. I like them against Calgary. The one team I'm really scared of playing is Minnesota. Minnesota's a team that we've faced the last two seasons in in the playoffs, and we beat them both times. But they're a different animal than they have been. I mean, they've been a physical team. They've been a pain in the butt to the Blackhawks. Match up pretty well with the Blackhawks. But the, the Hawks finally were just able to just use their star power and their speed and their finesse to get around them. But the one huge key difference between those other years and this year is Devin Dubnik. You've got a rock-solid goalie with Minnesota. Uh, for the life of me, I, I need I need to go back and watch some of those wild blues games because I was really shocked to see that that uh, St. Louis was able to score on him as much as they did, but the Hawks haven't been able to. They haven't figured the guy out, and this is a this is going to be a, a tough series for them. Um, you're gonna if you're the Hawks, you need to take these few days off. Uh, you've had a, f- a few days now. Um, from Saturday night to to Friday and figure out what you're going to do on defense. Are you going to play full six guys? Are you going to sit the old guys down and at least let young guys take minutes if even if they're not playing well, at least to take minutes off of Keith and Seabrook and Oduya and Jalmerson? Or what are you going to do? What are you going to do as far as your as far as your four lines? Uh, I mean Andrew Desjardins played very well, and he I think he earned his right to be able to play against the Wild. I think uh, it, as much as of, of an up and down, is, well, mostly down, that we've had with Antoine Vermette since he got, came over is the guy wins face-offs. That was a huge problem, and part of the reason that they lost last year to the, to the LA Kings was winning face-offs. If nothing else, Vermette wins face-offs. And he played, he was really trying to score. And he, I think he played pretty well that series. Um, the one guy that doesn't seem to get phased out of anything and, and still gets all of his minutes is Chris Versteeg. I don't understand why he's in there. I mean, what did he lead the Hawks in except for getting into fights with people? Uh, he didn't play well. Shaw didn't play that well either. But those are two guys that they're going to get their minutes. And uh, a guy like Tevo Teravainen, who I thought played fine, is not going to get a chance. And maybe that makes sense against a team that's rough and tumble like the Wild. Maybe you want a guy like Versteeg and Shaw and Bickle that are a little more physically imposing. Well, not so much Shaw, but he's he was a scrapper anyway. And maybe that's Maybe that's the key that you want to have those guys in there. But if you're able to get beyond them, uh, you would love to see a Tavo in the lineup against Anah- uh, Anaheim Ducks. I think you're going to need his sk- skill and uh, speed and 
inability to to beat them. Um, what else is there to say about the Blackhawks? It's this is a this is just going to be a really tough series. I mean, this is a completely different Minnesota Wild, and luckily enough, it's we're going to have home ice advantage for this one uh, with home with first game starting Friday. I, I think, I think if you're planning to beat this team, you can't give up early leads like you did to the Predators, because you're not going to be able to score those late, huge numbers of goals in the third period against uh, Dubnik. You're not going to be able to do that like you did against Pekarene. He, you hit a you hit a goalie that was hitting a slump, and you were able to 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 put some goals away on him. But Dubnik, you're really going to have to work to get those goals. Tough defense. Uh, I mean, another factor is against you had a lot of injuries for the Predators. Shea Weber. I mean, you had a lot of injuries on that team, and you still had a hard time scoring. Minnesota is going to be ready to play. They're pissed that you beat them the last two years. They're pissed that you uh, you beat them out in the the rankings this year to to get that third seed and home ice advantage. They've got a better goalie. They're they've got blood in their mouth. They want to take down the Blackhawks. They they're going to be fired up. They're going to be ready to play. The, are the Blackhawks going to be ready for that first game? I think that first game is going to tell a lot for what's going to happen in this series. If the Blackhawks come out on home ice, and remember on home ice, this is not going to be the Minnesota. You know, we go in there and have to play them on their their court. Are in their eyes. It's it's going to be in the madhouse. The Blackhawks are going to have to come out there if they plan to win the series and punch Minnesota right in their mouth, right off the bat. Be physical with them. Take them out of it. Be physical. Score first. Get to Dubnik. Show him that you're not afraid of him. He's not going to stonewall you. And put a guy in front of him. Interfere with him. Whatever you have to do. You've got to punch this team square in the mouth and let them know that to be the champs, you've got to beat the champs. And that's what the Blackhawks need to do. In that first round, there was none of that fire in there. I, I mean, you had you had some guys that were, were gunning for the win, and you could see who was just, just wanted that, that series win badly. But you're going to need to see that from more people from the get-go. It, Minnesota is a much better team than Nashville was down the stretch. And, and don't get me wrong, first half of the season, Nashville was tough. Nashville looked like they were going to be the team to beat in the NHL Finals. But they, they sputtered down the end, just like the Blackhawks. Minnesota, on the other hand, was just surging in that second half and went, to, went and beat a really good St. Louis Blues team who was playing well. And just beat them fair, beat them square, and just beat them. So the Hawks, the Hawks are a better team than Minnesota. But it's just that style of game. It's going to, like I said, they're going to have to punch that team in the mouth and establish dominance. Because if you lose that first game, you're really putting yourself in a hole. Because you've lost home ice advantage, and you're going to have to beat a rock-solid goalie to, to be able to win there against a tough defense. And the Hawks haven't been able to get it done in the power play. They haven't been doing so well in the penalty kill. Uh, other than face-offs, they, that's the only thing they haven't really been struggling with. So we shall see. Next time we talk, it's going to be a it's going to be a big show because we're going to already have a Blackhawks second round series game under our belt. We're going to have the, all the Bears picks in. Uh, maybe Chris Sale suspended. Maybe Jeff Samarja suspended. Which we'll get to more in a minute. Let's move on, though, to our other playoff struggling team, the Chicago Bulls. I haven't been watching as much of the games as I wanted to because I i don't know if you've probably figured this out. Is I'm a much bigger Blackhawks fan than I am a Bulls fan. That's why I love having Gary on. That's why I love having the guys from, from Ball on because they... They are they're my go-to Bulls guys. And I wanted to have Gary on today, but he is in a deep, dark pit. And he just kept texting me, they're done. They're done. Not going to win another game. They're done. I got reading these texts. And I was like, wow, Gary, you're a big negative Nancy. Uh, 
So the Bulls dominated Milwaukee during the season. They they lost that last game, but other than that, they just dominated them. And what 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 did they do? Look at the games. They went and they basically fed the ball to pow, 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 pow. Paul Gasol just dominated. There was no answer for Paul Gasol. There was no answer. So now that they have him in the playoffs, why aren't they doing that? Uh, I mean, the first two games, they looked good. That third win uh, was, they barely won. But the, that fourth game, the Bulls should have swept Milwaukee. And I'm going to put it in the way I see it, is you come back and you fight back in Milwaukee, and you're right there for the win. You get Derrick Rose, who they're trying to isolate, and he's trying to penetrate dribble with three guys on him. Milwaukee keeps five guys on the court at a time, based on NBA rules and traditions and, and the way the game is played. So if, if you're playing five on five and Derrick Rose is being triple teamed, if I, my math is correct, at least two bulls are wide open. And I bet one of them is Paul Gasol, who has dominated Milwaukee. If you're Derek and you're a point guard, you're a point guard, you pass the ball. Don't try to dribble in. Everybody in the world thinks you're going to dribble in. You pass the ball. Pass the ball to Paul Gasol. Let him score. Let him drive in there. And you're up two with no time left in the clock. You win the game and you go on and face Cleveland. Instead, you go down and you're, you have one second left in the clock. The Bucks are trying to score. Everybody in the world knew what was coming. Stacey King told you what was coming if you were one of the three people on earth that didn't know. Stacey King tells you what's going to happen. The only person in the world who didn't know what was going to happen is the one person who could have stopped it. Derek Rose just had this mental breakdown. He went to become a narcoleptic and fell asleep on the court. I, I don't get it. Is he pulled a, oh, which way did it go? Which way did it go? Which way did it go? And he allowed a guy with one second left to catch a wide open pass underneath the basket and lay it up. How in the world? How in the world? I mean, how, how are you Derek Rose and you, you let that happen? I mean, that's just mind numbing. And, and, and I tweeted with the guys from Ball and I was like, well, well what happened there? I mean, how has it happened? I mean, they're blaming turnovers and yeah, that's true. And Gary's blaming rebounding, which is true as well. But regardless, if you put this as a microcosm of, of the game in the last 10 seconds, it, Derek could have won it on two different chances. He could have stopped that pass, which would have you know, been overtime. But the way the Bulls were streaking, you expected them to win. But you could have put the ball in the hoop or passed it to somebody that could. It's, it's so frustrating. And if you watched... Is Milwaukee is dropping streamers and their players are celebrating. They won an NBA title. And why? Because they didn't get swept. That's a defeatist attitude. If I'm Milwaukee, I'm a player on Milwaukee, and we just barely won on a bonehead, two back-to-back -back bonehead plays by Derrick Rose that let us get a win on our home court, so we didn't get swept by the Bulls in the first round of the playoffs. I'm not happy. I'm not cheering. I'm not having a ticker tape parade in the middle of the, the court. I'm pissed off. I'm pissed. That's just, that's just mind boggling that they can, they can do that. I'm going, I want to beat these SOBs. I want to go back to Chicago now and I want to take one there. I mean, granted, they came in there and did that and they beat the Bulls. But they, I just don't know how you, you're an NBA professional team and you can be happy with just not getting swept. Uh, I mean, 
Gary, who's on the show quite a bit, my friend Gary, he's a huge Bulls fan, season ticket holder, and he doesn't think the Bulls are going to win this series. And I just, I just can't fathom how they can't. They've outclassed Milwaukee in every chance, and it's just been their bonehead, boneheadedness that's allowed Cleveland to stay in games and, and win. Uh, I mean, part of the problem is the Bulls have had horrible time with rebounding through the season. It's been a, I mean, how many times have I mentioned to you the Bulls need to rebound better? And that's been a big problem in this game. Turnovers. They've been a turnover machine. The other game, 28 turnovers. You can't do that and win. Maybe you can get away with it against Milwaukee, but against Cleveland, you can't do that. And if you're the Bulls, you've got Cleveland. You've got, let's not even call them Cleveland. Let's call them LeBron. LeBron has been that hurdle that you can't get over. And right now, you've got LeBron in your sights in the weakest he can possibly be. You've got him in a first year of, of a new team, which always means that you're going to have some adjustment period. They're never going to be as good that first year until you figure things out. And you've got a player suspended for two games for an altercation. And you've got Kevin Love, who's not going to play in the whole series because of a torn labrum in his shoulder. So if you're the Bulls, you need to go in there and end this series against the Bucks. You can't let this go to Game 7. You can't give the Bucks the momentum and this thought that they could win four straight against the Bulls to go on and face the, the Cleveland Cavaliers. You can't do that. You've got to go in there, and you've got to pound away. You've got to pound Paul. Pound, 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 pound. And beat them. And beat them bad. And show them who owns this division. And... Who owns this this hour long corridor between the two of you? And then you go in there and you have to win those first two games against Cleveland. Because once once they're they've got a more full team, you're gonna have your hands full. Uh, I mean, I guarantee you, if the Bulls don't win this series against uh, Milwaukee, is Tom Thibodeau is gone. Tom Thibodeau will not be back. Zero chance. But if you go and win this series and you're able to beat Cleveland, I really do think he is back. So you, if, if you're the Bulls, this is, this is your time right now. You've got you've to work this. You've got to do this. Uh, your team's get it, get, only going to get older next year. Is Joe's knees are only a year older. Paul Gasol is going to be 400. Uh, I mean, this is this is your window right here. You've got to be able to go in there and close down Milwaukee. You've got to get physical on those boards, whether that means Joe or Taj going in there and crashing boards. Whatever it's got to be is you've got to get those boards, box people out. Um, you've got to stop the turnovers and just put Milwaukee in their place. Beat them like you have the first three times you faced them this season. Um, so uh, we had one listener that, that emailed in what, asking what I thought was going to happen in game six. And I, I think that the Bulls, it's going to be another home game for them. Because every game is a home game for them in the series. Uh, and I think the Bulls are going to dominate from the get-go. There's going to have one rough period, or one more rough period. Just a, hawk, a hockey talk. They're going to have one rough quarter, I think, where Cleve, or, uh, Milwaukee is going to scratch their way back into it. It's going to look like a closer score than it really is. And then the Bulls are going to, the Bulls are going to step on the gas and pull away in the fourth quarter, win by 10, 10 or 12. I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, and then go get ready for Cleveland. So let's talk about the surprising Cubs. Cubs are 11 and 7 right now. Only a game out of first place. 11 and 7. They've got an over 600 winning percentage. In the recent power rankings, they're ranked 8th. Uh, there's a quote from uh, Joe Madden, their coach. We've done a nice job on the road. 
I'm telling you, the energy pregame in the dugout is outstanding. The guys are definitely on top of things. They're ready to play. And as a manager, that's all you can ask for. And I know that I, I, me and most other people expected a lot more out of the Cubs. But we're really seeing a lot out of the Chicago Cubs. I mean, this is, this is going to be an uphill battle because Cardinals are the, are the class of the NL, I think. Um, they're, I mean, regardless of what, what the uh, Mets are doing right now, I think they're going to come back down to earth. But the Cardinals are a really good team. And it's going to be an uphill battle for the Cubs. And if they're going to make the postseason, it's going to be as a wild card, I think. But if, if the season were to end today, and granted, we're not even 20 games in out of a 162-game season, the Cubs are the number one wild card team as far as the standings go. Um, and, and you're still not playing as best as you can. You're, you're having a lot of starters not go that many innings. You're taxing your bullpen a lot. You still have your, your ace, John Lester. Not, he just had his first quality start of the season and didn't get a win. Um, once you get him turned back around and, and back on the right track, he, this is a hell of a ball club. You've got a hell of a road starting rotation. The, the bullpen's been, been pitching well. You're, you're getting timely hitting. I mean, these are like the cardiac kids. With all these late seventh, eighth, ninth inning and over our extra inning wins, this is just great baseball. This is a lot of fun, regardless of whether or not they win or lose. It's really fun to watch this team because there's no quit in them. Uh, Castro has been super clutch. Chris Bryant has been the real deal, and I really expected last week to talk to you guys because I ended up scratching baseball talk, but I really expected to come in there and be like. Guys, you need to temper your expectations about Chris Bryant. He's a rookie. What do you expect from him? That was I wrong. I mean, I, I knew he was going to be a good baseball player, but it's, it's really hard to step right into Major League Baseball and just play well. It's really hard to do that. Not too many people do. Even Hall of Fame guys, they don't just step right up there. They, they take some a little bit of time. and uh. And, and Chris Bryant is just playing lights out baseball. I mean, he's even playing good at third base position. I mean, uh, let's let's look at their the stats here. In so far in ten games this season, thirty seven at bats. Chris Bryant has thirteen hits, four doubles, nine RBIs, eight walks, and a stolen base, batting three fifty one. With a uh, a 478 on base percentage and a 938 OPS, that's pretty darn good. Uh, he, he, it's if things don't change, he's going to be the runaway rookie of the year winner. Um, but it's it's just not. I mean, he just looks like a professional guy out there. And you take away that first game where he had four strikeouts and it went 0 for five. It's He's he's 13 out of, if you take that away, he's 13 out of 32. And he's batting over 400. He just looks like a good hitter out there. Um, and, and like I was saying is, you've also got John Lester that's just starting to turn the corner. Um, I mean, he threw a, he picked up a no decision in that 11 inning, 7-3 win for the Cubs over Cincinnati. Uh, but it was his first quality start of the year. Uh, he struck out 10 on 104 pitches and and lowered his ERA, lowered his whip. And and that's a big step from his first three starts in which he gave up 12 earned runs, 24 hits, and 15 innings of baseball, or 15.2. So you start to get a corner turn with Lester. You get a good start out of him. And the way the hitting is going and the rest of the rotation and the bullpen is playing, You've got a really good team on your hands. Um, I mean, who else? Uh, I mean, Anthony Rizzo. And the, the great part about this is the Cubs are scoring runs. This is the first time I've seen this in a long time, is the Cubs are scoring runs without hitting home runs. They're not relying on the long ball to score runs. They're playing small ball. 
They're getting singles. They're stealing bases, getting doubles, clearing the bases, running with the pitch. This is great baseball. Uh, uh, I mean, let me let me go through this. Is when your leading home run hitter on the team is a tie with Miguel Montero and Chris Coglin. You're not hitting a lot of home runs. Um, I mean, here's the home run numbers. Rizzo's got two. Castro's got two. Soler's got two. Fowler's got one. Castillo's got two. Uh, Coglin's got three. Montero's got three. And Mike Holt has one. That's it. That's the only home runs you have. And you're 11 and seven in one game out of first place and in the lead in the wild card. That's. That's small ball right there, and that's what you need to do to have consistent winning and win in postseason. And it's been so great to see because you already saw the the skeleton of a really good team, and then all these young players are coming up and contributing. You've got the ace, the stay, the staff is is aces for the most part, and Joe Madden's got this team thinking they can win. They're going in there and. and they're competing there until that that final out in the ninth inning is is called. This team has not quit. And that's just great to see. It's finally this wit it's a winning attitude in Chicago baseball. That's awesome. I love to see that. I've never seen that before. Even when they were winning, you felt like, oh my God, this team is gonna lose. They're losers. What's gonna happen? But this team doesn't have that. They don't have, I mean, a lot of it is you've brought new players in. You've got young players who don't know this. And you've got a manager who doesn't believe in that. And ownership and and general manager staff that are going to change things. And you've, you're you taking that, that loser mentality, that lovable loser mentality, and driving that demon out of the stadium. Um, you've got... Bryant batting 351 and Rizzo batting 344 and Castro 324. And even though he's only batting 270, uh, you Soler is is playing well. I mean, let's talk about Jorge Soler. Is um he's only played 54 career games above a baseball level before he made his major league debut last season. And he went for an 0-15 for streak this season, but he was playing well up to that point. And he finally broke that during a 4-0 win against uh, Pittsburgh. And and he's a young player, but he's he's coming there ready to play. He's was the best hitter for the first few weeks of the season for the Cubs. And I honestly think Jorge Soler has a chance to be a better baseball player than Chris Bryant. And that takes nothing away from Chris Bryant. I just think Jorge Soler is a fantastic baseball player. Uh, so I, that's really all I have to say about the Cubs is is the kids are playing well. Um, you know, the the only real real holes you're seeing is is Lester's had some struggles. Schlitter had some struggles, but they sent him down. Um, but uh, Addison Russell is is. is is not yet where you want him to be, and but he's so young. I mean, he's the youngest player in baseball right now, at least the National League. He's so young. It the guy's got to get his feet wet a little bit more, and he's he's not a top top prospect for no reason. Uh, the kid is the kid is competing hard. He's patient at the plate. It's gonna come to him. That what's gonna happen is one day that light's gonna turn on. The game's going to slow down. He's going to start driving in hits. And if you have, if you get that second base position really lined up, you're going to be a hell of a team. Uh, you finally have a leadoff hitter in Dexter Fowler, who's who's not hitting great, but he's he's got a 340 on base percentage. Not bad for, for a leadoff hitter. Uh, you've got Chris Coglin, who's... You know, leading the team in home runs. Um, you've got you've got first base. You've got your all star, shortstop, all star. You've got all world Chris Bryant playing third. Uh, you've got a, a catching rotation of three three guys that's working. I mean, I, I was skeptical. I thought 
Wellington, Wellington Castillo was going to be traded. And they haven't. They've put him in the rotation and they've been making him work and and putting him in when they need to to make double switches. And it's it's been really great and fun to watch. And I love the way that this team is competing. And and for once in a long time, it's great to it's great fun to be watching Chicago baseball. And speaking of which, let's just hop over to the White Sox. And what can I say about this team? I, I mean we were hopeful of going into the season. I thought they were going to be better than they were, at least better than the Cubs. But, I mean, they're not as bad as the Twins or the Indians, but they're not as good as Kansas City or Detroit. Uh, they've got a big hurdle to get over, and they're just not doing it yet. And, and maybe they're turning the corner. Right now in the power rankings, they're ranked 19th. But... They are winners of back-to-back -back home series against division opponents. They beat Cleveland in a series at home, and they beat Kansas City in a series at home that was marred by bench-clearing brawl that was just completely ridiculous. Let's So you finally have them playing some winning baseball, and, and uh, sorry, I'm going to pause for a second, is over the weekend I got a concussion. I hit my head going up the stairs. We have a low point in the ceiling, and I hit my head and got a concussion. So I've been really, like, out of it the last few days. It's weird. It's a weird feeling. It's my first concussion. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but White Sox is, I mean, Jose Abreu is, is hitting well. Five home runs. Um, he's got a, over a, a, a one OPS. Uh, batting 313. Uh, Beckham has been hitting. Uh, Avi Garcia is is hitting. Um, I, I mean, guys are finally starting to hit the ball a little bit. Uh, your starting pitching is good, and the bullpen is just you got a closer at least. But the the mid the the middle relief is not what you'd hoped it was going to be when they rebuilt this team. Um, but it's a. This team's got a way to go, and I think they have the talent to be able to do it. And maybe this brawl is what's going to be the the spark that that ignites these guys and gets this team playing better. Is that would be nice if if they could turn it around and and start on a surge like the Cubs have been on. Um, and and talking about the brawl is uh in the seventh inning of of the other the game the other night against the the Kansas City Royals. Both benches emptied at the end of the seventh after Ventura from the uh, Kansas City, their pitcher. He fielded an Adam Eaton comeback. It took several steps off the mound, was staring at the hitter and shouting obscenities at him, then threw to first. Adam Eaton, he took offense, confronted uh, Ventura, and then both benches cleared. And it looked pretty much mild. There was some shoving and some screaming and guys getting in faces. And then some sort of chaos broke out. And it's really hard to see who was involved in what. Except for Jeff, I mean, Chris Sales in, in a coach's face. And Jeff Samarge's big, ugly, dumb hair is flopping all over the place. And he's trying to do karate on everybody. And that's going to hurt because Sale and Samarge each got suspended five games. And it didn't look so bad on the field. But dumb... Chris Sale, who he goes and tries to confront the entire team in their locker room for the whole Kansas City team. I, I don't get it. What was, what was he going to do? The guy weighs like 75 pounds soaking wet. Is he going to fight 25 guys and coaches? Pfft, come on, get out of here. Uh, he's just a, He was a hothead. And I, I mean, this could go one of two ways. And one is that, that Sale and Samarja serve their five game suspension and the team bottoms out and, and struggles during that because they don't even know who they're going to pitch during these during the 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 suspension uh who are they who are they going to play that's i don't i can't answer that because robin ventura can't even answer that yet or it could be the spark that this team says listen we we got in this fight we're a team we stuck by each other we had each other's backs 
and we beat Kansas City, a team that's ahead of us in the rankings that has been one of the top teams in baseball so far, and we beat them uh, pretty well. And then, and you can say that could be the spark. I, I mean, it could go either way. Uh, you hope for Chicago baseball's sake that it's going to be the spark, but but we don't know. Um, and it, it's hard to tell because uh, you'd hope that they would be able to. I mean, this is baseball regular season. Games are one after the other after the other. Sometimes two in a day, but. The White Sox had the unfortunate, uh, they had rain delays, and now they've got protester riot delays in, in Baltimore. That's really taken that momentum that they've started to earn with two back-to-back series wins and, and the brawl and, and whatnot. And, and you, have, you have them going to Baltimore and games postponed because of, of the riots. And then they're finally going to play a game tomorrow, which is Wednesday, in front of an empty stadium. They're not going to officials aren't going to let anybody any fans into the game so they're going to be playing to an empty stadium i mean i I get what else are you going to do you know forfeit the game you can't really do that but it's going to be really odd and i'm not saying anything about what's going on in baltimore that's not that's not the purpose of this show the purpose of this show is to talk about sports and chicago sports in general and I'm curious of how this momentum is gonna is gonna be able to maintain itself after rain delays and protest delays and playing in an empty stadium. Are they gonna be able to carry that? And did they did they get that momentum burst at the wrong time? I don't know. We shall see. One last thing I want to talk about is our Chicago Bears, and this is gonna be a big Bears episode next week because it's gonna be after the draft. Uh I'm going to do my last mock draft of the year. Uh, this is going to be the one going into uh, the draft starts Thursday. We're Tuesday. I have round one, Kevin White, who's been my go-to guy for the last several weeks. Uh, I just, I can't see the Bears picking anybody else unless somebody fall, the, unless the Bears decide to trade out of that spot. Or somebody falls farther than I expect them to fall. And I think I'm hearing rumors that there might be a little bit of a tumbling of Leonard Williams. uh, Which, if that's the case, I think the Bears would jump at the opportunity to draft him. Because if you can put him as one of your 3-4 defensive ends, wow, are you going to have... An absolute beast. You could put him and Ray McDonald, and that's going to be a tough spot for that quarterback to, to, to not get sacked because Leonard Williams is a beast. I love watching that guy play. And I'm hearing rumors that, that other teams aren't. Not, I'm not going to say they're not as high. It's that they have other needs that they want to fill, and they're going to be and from what I'm hearing from insiders is that some teams are going to take biggest need over best player available. And I think they're, if they do that, they're going to lose out on possibly the best player in the draft. But realistically, I can't see Len Williams falling the seven. And I don't see the Bears trading up to get anybody unless somebody's willing to take Cutler or Forte. I don't think they're going to give up the draft picks because they don't they only have 6 and I don't see them trading some of those to move up one or two spots. Just can't see it. And Kevin White is an absolutely phenomenal freak of an athlete. He's just a good kid. Uh no red flags at all about his character, about his football ability. Um uh, and he fits. He's not only would be the best player available at that spot, so you would not be, you'd not be, you'd not be reaching for a guy at all in the least. And he fills it. You're probably your biggest need at number one wide receiver after you trade Brandon Marshall. So it's just a home run all around. Is you get an absolute beast in a position you need, who's best player available. It's it's too much of a win. It makes too much sense for the Bears to do anything else unless it's Amari Cooper. 
but I, I still like Kevin White better. Round two, I have the Bears drafting Benardrick McKinney, the middle linebacker from Mississippi State. Uh, again, the Bears, Bears still need to shore up that defense. Um, a lot of holes to fill, a lot of places to upgrade. I still think you, have, you signed Mason Foster to one year. He's going to be one of your inside linebackers. You need another one who can play. You can't rely on Jonathan Bostic. You can't rely on Shay McClellan. I think you go in there and you get the second best middle linebacker, second rated middle linebacker in the draft, and that's Benardrick McKinney out of Mississippi State. Round three, uh, you pick, I have him picking Devin Funches, uh, who played wide receiver at Michigan. I think he, as I've said before, I think he ends up transitioning to tight end in the NFL. And if he's, that's the case, I don't think he's going to be much of a factor this year. I think next year, when he has some time to grow into his body, get bigger and get stronger, he's going to be a hell of a tight end for the Bears. And I think he's going to have show spots this year because you put him in a two tight end set and you become a much more dynamic offense because you've got the two wider or two tight ends that are a tough matchup for, for anybody because they're both big and fast and strong and, and could basically be giant wide receivers. Can't, you can't put a cornerback on them because they're too small and you can't put safety on them because they're too small and you can't put a linebacker on there because they're too fast that creates a hell of a matchup and then you have kevin white and and alshon jeffrey it makes a much easier game for for jay cutler to to not screw up so i i have devin funches at number th or the third pick fourth pick again i go right back to defense to try to shore things up and ibrahim campbell uh safety out of northwestern uh there's there's going to be some safeties that there's a lot of safeties in this draft that aren't top flight safeties. They've all got hiccups in their game. They've all got some issues going on. But they also all are have the ability a lot of them have the ability to be a good safety in this league. Um I think Abraham Campbell is one of the safer ones. Um may not have the highest ceiling, but I think he's one of the safer ones. I think he can come in and and be able to play special teams for you and then come in when there's injuries and eventually work his way up to being a starter. Round five is you fill another hole. Sure, you got Will Montgomery and you got rid of a weak link in uh, Roberto Garza, but uh, Montgomery is a one-year fill. You take, and this is a deep draft class at center. I mean, I'm talking deep. Um, deep, way deeper than it has been in recent memory. You take Reese Dismukes, the center from Auburn, in the fifth round. And at fifth round, he's an absolute steal. I think he could step in there and possibly be your game one starter, or your day one starter. Uh, and that means if you can shore up that right tackle spot, you're going to have a hell of an offensive line. And finally, with your sixth pick is... I have them taking offensive tackle Corey Robinson out of South Carolina. And at this point, sixth round is when you, sixth, seventh round, which Bears don't have a seventh rounder, is you take guys that are athletes that can play special teams and you take offensive linemen that you hope you can groom. That's really what you take in those rounds. Um, and Corey Robinson, you, you need somebody that's to groom into an offensive tackle. And and you hope it's him. Um, so that that's my final mock draft of prior to the NFL draft this coming Thursday. Uh, and again, like I said, I called it the Bears making no more moves before the draft. You have Matt Forte didn't show up to, to voluntary camp. No big deal. He wants a contract and he's going to be a 30-year-old running back and they're not going to give him a lot of money. Uh, but he's making a lot of money right now. It's it's the last year of a deal. He's going to play. No need to worry. I don't see them trading Matt Forte because who's going to want to trade for a 30-year-old running back that's due $8 million unless his name 
is Adrian Peterson. So if, if you're the Bears, you just say, whatever, he's going to come and play, and he's going to play his best because he's going to want a contract. And if you're Matt Forte, you say, crap, I want a contract. I need to play this out. And you go in there and play as hard as you can. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. This is no big deal. If Jay Cutler doesn't show up, on the other hand, that's a big deal because you need him to get as much face time as possible with the new offensive coordinator, the new coach, the new GM, learn the system, earn that contract that you already did sign, and make that money. Um, so nothing really to, to report. Uh, trades, I've heard some rumors about potential trades. I really don't see the Bears making any significant uh draft day trades every team makes some sort of trade during the draft and to move up a couple spots down a couple spots out of a round into a round uh maybe maybe the bears do do a little trading in the mid to late rounds i really don't see them moving in the first round at all i i think they're going to hold tight at seven unless unless that the draft goes absolutely horrible for them. And you have both quarterbacks, Mariota and Jameis Winston off the board. You have Dante Fowler off the board. You have Leonard Williams off the board. You have Amari Cooper off the board. And you have Kevin White off the board. If in that absolute worst case scenario happens, and the six guys that you, you could take with that pick are off the board, then you consider trading back. You maybe trade back with Cleveland and go to 12. Trade back with Atlanta. You know, you trade back a few picks. Then you're able to step in there and take those next tier of guys, those, the, um, the, the Landon Collins and, and those type of guys, the, the Vic Beasley's, uh, you know, that type of player. Um, and your Danny Shelton's those those kind of guys that you can you can take if you reach at seven you're overpicking, but if you move back to, to ten twelve around there, uh, you're starting to get in the wheelhouse of where they could be drafted. And one final thing I want to throw out there is, I'm hearing rumors that all right now that that Randy Gregory has been caught with the the, the marijuana use is he went from being a top ten guy to. He could be there at the last few picks of the first round. And if you're the Bears and you have Randy Gregory there available, you have to consider making that move to trade up from your second round pick back into the first round and going after him. You have to at least consider it because he's a talented guy uh, and you have to at least consider that. So... That's the last I'm going to talk about, and we've got the NFL draft just days away. So excited to, to see what's going to happen. Uh, if you guys are at the draft, come find me. Uh, we'll give you a shout out on the air. I'm going to be recording some fans. Um, and uh, yeah, and that, that's about it. So come, come say hi. Uh, and, and until next time, bear down. Thanks for listening. And check us out at SwirskySports.com, Twitter at SwirskySports, Facebook.com, SwirskySports. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Uh, 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Her, you can have her, she's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on planes. Bears 31, the negative seven. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.